Hey there, and welcome to Cyberpunk Librarian. I'm Daniel Messer. Linus Torvalds, the guy who created Linux, once said, Intelligence is the ability to avoid doing work, yet getting the work done. I think that most of us, no matter what kind of job we do, find ourselves burdened with repetitive tasks. They're the tasks that you have to do every day, or every hour, or once a week, or maybe there is no schedule. You just have stuff you need to do for several people, but they all need the same thing. It's just that one needs it a little differently, and... Yeah. In 21 years of library work, I've come across this several times and often find myself asking the same question I asked the last time I happened into this problem. Geez, isn't there a reason we have all of these computers? It's strange that, even in this digital age of interconnected worldwide networks, I still find myself punching the same keys over and over and over again to do the same repetitive tasks that I'll do again at some point. It was the same keys last week, and it's the same keys this week, and it'll be the same keys next week and the week after, and so on. Don't we have computers for this kind of thing? Oh wait, I'm using a computer. But it still needs me to hit this sequence of keys, because it doesn't know any better. That's when it becomes really useful to step back and examine that repetitive task from a different viewpoint. Break it down a bit, ask questions, and walk through it a step at a time. Maybe there is some way to automate it, or maybe there's a way to reduce the number of steps, or maybe you can change it slightly and make it easier. Either way, a repetitive task has at least one thing going for it. It can likely be optimized. After you break it down and discover exactly what has to be done, there's nothing wrong with automating your workflow to make things a little bit easier. Beyond that, automation not only speeds up the task, but it can remove avenues to mistakes, standardize the output, and tidy up something that used to be messy. So don't get mad that the computer doesn't know any better than to automate your task. Teach it a better way. This is Cyberpunk Librarian, episode 47, Outsourcing Your Job to a Computer. My name is Daniel Messer, your friendly neighborhood cyberpunk librarian, welcoming you back to the show that explores the intersection of libraries and technology and is all about living that high-tech, low-budget lifestyle. Hey there, that's right, I'm not dead and neither is the show. Cyberpunk Librarian is back on the air, running the fiber, and rolling through your smartphone into your ear holes with a brand new episode. So, I had to take a bit of a hiatus to deal with some projects at home and projects at work, and there's been a few things here and there that I've been fiddling with, and with everything, finding time to research and write a new show was difficult at best and impossible at the worst. But hey, things are settling down a bit, and thank the cosmos for that. Hopefully, we can get back into a regular groove again. So settle back, my friends and listeners, and hey, thanks for tuning into the show. I hope you like this one as we're going to talk about scratching that itch and handling repetitive tasks with a little programming and automation. See, even for my listeners who don't work in electric library land, I bet you too have a job or a task that's the same damn thing every time you do it. Stuff needs updating, and a number needs incrementing. Put these files in that folder, just like you put those files there last week and the week before that, and then you start to think to yourself, hey, weren't these computers supposed to help me get stuff done? I think there's a law of physics that work, like energy, cannot be destroyed. It can only be transformed. 
After all, many people went from shoving the same report into the same manila folder, which they then filed away in a metal filing cabinet, to dropping the same PDF into the same directory on the same server. The work is the same, but it's been transformed into a digital version of itself. That in mind, I'm going to share two or three problems I've had over the years and talk about how I fix them by analyzing the task, taking a little pause, writing a little code, and swearing a whole awful lot. While I'm sure there are people out there who can write code without dropping in a few four or five letter words, I'm not one of them. Right, so let's get to work on not doing so much work. Now, before we dive in, I want to stress something. We're going to be talking about writing code and stuff, and if you don't know how to write programs or fiddle around with scripts, you know, that's fine. This is not the show that will teach you how to write code in any programming language, and that's for a couple of reasons. One, we don't have that kind of time. Two, I'm not really a developer. Sure, I know how to write code, but there are, right now, in the basements of parents' houses all over the world, kids who can write code far better than I can. Chances are, if I'm writing code, then something has gone horribly wrong, which goes back to why I'm writing the code in the first place. So I'll talk about different programming languages throughout the show, but let me try and soothe any worry with a couple of bits of wisdom. First, you don't need to be an expert to write working code. I mean, just look at me. Second, if I can do this crap, then so can you. Seriously, when it comes to being, you know, a software developer, I'm a pretty decent podcaster. Okay, moving on. Long ago and far away, I had this problem with the ILS because it didn't yet have the ability to print hold pickup slips. In case you don't know, lots of libraries have a public hold pickup shelf. So when a patron requests an item and it comes in, the library checks it in, puts a slip in it with the patron's name, and pops it out on the shelf for pickup. Modern integrated library systems, the ILS, will print these things automatically, but that wasn't always the case. So when we checked things in, we'd have to write the patron's name by hand on a slip of paper and then put that in the book and then put it on the pickup shelf. I was getting into some Perl madness at the time, so I wrote a little Perl script to do this kind of thing for the circulation department. Now, to be honest, this Perl script was a dirty, filthy hack, and I should be ashamed of it. But basically, it allowed me to feed copy and pasted information to a program running in a command line that eventually spit my input out onto a receipt printer. Sometimes I'd copy and paste, other times I just typed it. But for those of us who knew what Control-C and Control-V could do, and for those of us who type faster than we write, this thing was much faster and much better. And everyone could read the slips, which is an extra bonus because my handwriting is kind of atrocious. It's not bad, but it's not good. So because the library I worked for at the time didn't process hundreds of holds per day, my little script did the job. A few years later, in a completely different library, but with the same ILS, I ran into this problem again. Unlike the first library, this branch was processing hundreds of holds per day, and I mean sometimes 800 or more. And guess what? By that point, the ILS still hadn't updated to print out the whole pickup slips. That was one of those things that was always coming in a future update, you see. So that meant that almost everyone from pages to librarians were checking in holds and using a sharpie to write patron names on slips of paper. Processing holds for the day literally took all day, and it wasn't unusual to find yourself processing some of yesterday's requests the day after. 
that's crazy insane, man. And you can bet one thing, though. A Perl script was not the answer. So once again, I was forced to do the things you need to do when you're looking at a problem that computers should have already solved for you. Step one. Well, take a step back. You're likely invested in this project and this problem on a professional, possibly even a personal level. If you were in my boat, you'd have been invested in a, an emotional level because that emotion was anger. Step two, assess the problem from a higher level. What are we doing and why is it wrong? Can we change anything right now to make it better? What are we really looking at here? What's the workflow? Can it be changed or are we going to need to write something that fixes or automates it? Step three. All right, well, you got this far. So you've decided that you probably do need to write something to make it better. You're going to have to write some code. Okay, so what are you really looking at? Do you need a macro type thing that simply automates the process with a couple keystrokes? If so, well, what is that process? What are the steps involved in getting it done? Step four, get to work on the code. You know, start putting your fingers on the keyboard and typing commands. You're going to screw it up at least twice, probably more. That's fine. It's code. If it were easy, you'd be a developer and everybody could do it. Step five. Did you get something working? Great. Now have others try it. Stuff that always seems to work fine on your computer will break on others. I don't know why. It just seems to be a law of the universe. Find out what breaks and fix it. Step six. Monitor the heck out of it. Chances are things will pop up and you'll need to adjust. Stuff will change and you might need to account for that. But you know what's worse than spending a couple of hours on some code? Spending countless hours doing something mind-numbing and menial. So let's talk about examples and what you can do. Going back to the hold slips dilemma, Perl was just a non-starter in this case. The ILS had matured somewhat and was completely based in Microsoft Windows. This was around 2006, so I picked up something that was the new hotness at the time because I figured it was the best solution for the problem, or at least an avenue to the best solution. Visual Basic 2006. I'd never written anything in Visual Basic before, but I figure basic is basic, and basically if I'd written basic programs in basic, then I could write another program in Visual Basic, right? So... Along with Visual Basic, I snagged a couple of books, literally off the library shelves, on how to make this thing work. So okay, let's walk through those steps one more time with a real problem. Step one, I took a step back. It helped that I'd handled this situation before in a different way, but this time there was an urgency involved just because of the sheer number of holds. Step two, well, the workflow really couldn't be changed. When an item on hold came in, Someone would check it in, a box would pop up on the screen to tell them it was a, you know, it was an on-hold thing, and what the customer's name is. They'd write that name on a slip of paper before clicking OK or hitting Enter on the keyboard to complete the hold and move on. There was really only one way to process an incoming hold, so on to step three. I figured out a process that would take the output from that box that popped up on the screen, remember? And, you know, that, that would be sent to a printer. This happened with a screen scraping technique that just basically gathered the name and held it in a buffer. Since we held items for pickup for seven days, in other words, you had seven days to come get the hold after it came in, I also had the app calculate the pull date if the customer didn't come in for the hold. That way a page could leaf through the slips and pull the expired holds pretty easily. You just you know, flip through the slips, you find a date that's before today, and you pull that item. All of this, you know, all of this was sent to the receipt printer attached to almost every staff computer in the library. So you could basically do this anywhere. Step four. I probably spent a week and a half during my off-desk hours working on the code. I had a couple of items in my office that I, you know, constantly put on hold, filled the hold, used the app I was working on, figured out what wasn't working and why, and made adjustments. Someone who knew what they were doing and weren't writing their first Visual Basic program could have probably whipped this thing up in an afternoon. But no one was in a hurry, we didn't have any Visual Basic developers, and... Because I really hadn't told anyone I was working on this, 
you know, I could take my time. See, I didn't want to get hopes and expectations up. I don't want to tell someone, well, I'm working on a program that's going to fix this problem. So, you know, especially if that doesn't work out, then people are disappointed. So it was the ultimate in under-promising and over-delivering. Step five. Once I got something to work semi-reliably, you know, semi I'd compile one or two different versions of the app and pop them into a, an individual folder that we have to try out on the front desk and on another workstation. Sometimes I'd pop it on a little thumb drive or something like that and just take it to another computer. I'd tested for another week, making sure it worked in all of the places that it might be used. Obviously, as things broke, I'd fix them and make adjustments where I needed to. Finally, step six, since I was the head of circulation at the time, I was able to have my staff give it a shot. Needless to say, they were pretty happy with the results. No more writing, no more inky, sharpied fingers, no more weird handwriting, you know, because after you write a hundred names, you start to kind of get a little bit illegible with that sharpie. And even though the receipt printer wasn't the fastest thing in the world, it was faster than writing. Folks even figured out that they could just keep stacking up the holes, checking them in, letting the slips print, and then stuffing the slips in the book as they went. They kind of developed their own workflow. So once again, no matter how you think someone will use your app or your solution, chances are you're probably wrong. Maybe a year or so later, no joke, it took them about that long, the ILS finally updated to print out these hold slips for us, and my little app was struck down by obsolescence. Some people might be saddened by that, but not me. The whole thing was kind of a hack. But it was a working hack, and we printed probably tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of pickup slips with it in that time. A couple of other libraries used it too, and they printed thousands of pickup slips on their own. When the ILS introduced the functionality, though, it was better because it's built in, it's native, and you know people that had worked on it actually knew what they were doing. Though there was one little thing that made me giggle. I'm not a developer, and I will say that for the rest of my life. So my code probably wasn't the cleanest, most compact code in the world. And I had a devil of a time with one part of that little app. See, when you print out one of these slips, you slip it into the book and leave the name and pull date sticking out, right? Well, that means you need to have some blank part of the receipt that goes between the pages of the book or the cover of the Blu-ray or whatever so it won't fall out. To force it to print this blank part, which I called a tail, I'd have it roll 40 carriage returns up the slip and then print a period. That way it was forced to do the 40 carriage returns and print something after that. As an aside, I have no idea why I remember that it was 40 carriage returns, but I know for a fact that it was. Anyway, I had the same length at the end of the slip, and there was always plenty to stick in the book, whether it was a short name or a long name. The funny thing? When the ILS introduced this feature, I printed out a hold slip to test it. You know, I've got to make sure that this works. Got to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to do. And I noticed right down at the end of the slip, just above where you tear it off, there was a period. If you weren't looking for it, you'd have never seen it. Okay, so let's talk about something that you can actually have a look at. Because the code for my whole pickup slip solution is long gone, and that's probably a good thing. Now let's talk about a simple problem of automation, which is something that circulation folks come across every day. There are so many tasks in a circulation librarian's life that are just like a dance. Waltz around the system doing the same thing over and over again. One, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three. 
This became a real issue a few years ago when the library I worked for decided to start charging a fee for unclaimed holds. See, we're back to holds again. So we had this problem with people putting a bunch of stuff on hold and then never coming around for it. Or they cherry-pick the holds they had and we'd wind up sending out a bunch of stuff back. So between the courier time and the staff time, it was kind of starting to add up. They, uh, they decided to impose a reshelving fee for the time and money it'd take to get the holds back to where they belonged. It was a really easy fee to dodge. If you put something on hold, just come get it. Heck, you could check it out and dump it in the drop as you left the building. At least the thing got its circulation statistic. Okay, fine, fine. There's a solution to a vexing problem. But it came with another. The ILS, uh, once again, we're back to it not automatically doing things. It didn't automatically charge for an unclaimed fee on an unclaimed hold. And it still doesn't. I doubt there's any code or logic in there that would even tell it how to do that. So, once again, the staff are doing the same thing over and over again. Pull the expired holds from the shelf, scan the item, see who it's on hold for, bring up their account, charge the fee, close that stuff out, check the item in to clear the hold and send it on its way. Fortunately for us, and for me, there were two great things about this process. Number one, it was the same process over and over again and would remain the same process for the foreseeable future. No change, no plans to implement any change like that in the ILS itself. Number two, every bit of it could be done using the keyboard if you knew how. So what does that mean? It means we can automate the hell out of that. So I've talked about a scripting and automation language called AutoHotKey here on the show before. AutoHotKey can do quite a lot, but one of the things it's especially good at is automating keystrokes. If you know the keystrokes to send and you know how to write some AutoHotKey, you can work a little magic on your workflow. After a little analyzing and figuring, some trial and error and a few notes, I boiled this down to a set of keystrokes that always worked, and I just wrote a little app. The user would have to do two things. They would have to scan the barcode of the item into the ILS. You really can't get around that. And the second thing is they would have to hit Control-Alt-U on the keyboard, U for unclaimed, and let the computer do its thing. Now, all this thing did was send the same keystrokes to the computer that a user would. Nothing more, nothing less. And if that doesn't sound like a huge feat of software ingenuity, that's because it isn't. But it had a few advantages over doing it by hand. The first, number one, is that it was always right. You never messed anything up because that workflow didn't change. Number two, it was faster than a user clickety-clicking around with a mouse. Number three, anyone could do it, including someone who was there on their first day on the job. Not a lot of training goes into scan this and press this on the keyboard. And number four, it standardized the system. While you could have added this unclaimed fee to a, an account in a couple different ways, this one was the fastest, and it was consistent. Funny thing, we, uh, we stopped charging that fee not long ago, so this thing really didn't go obsolete more than it just became useless. But you know what? You can have it. I'll have the links in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast if you want to look at it. Maybe you'll get some ideas, and maybe you'll just giggle at my laughably bad code. Now, sometimes you have to scratch your own itch, and those are the best and the worst of times. You'll find yourself working down the barrel of a job or a task that, really, only you can do. And unfortunately, that task is a huge pain in the ass. So, so far this episode, we've talked about fixing problems with Perl, Visual Basic, and AutoHotKey. And those are great tools and languages, and there are others out there if you're into learning that stuff. Seriously, I think AutoHotKey is probably the easiest one to learn, and if you're working in Windows you can work some miracles with that thing sometimes. 
When you get into the business of solving problems, sometimes the most fiddly ones are the ones you have to solve for yourself. So let's see here. Part of my job is making slides for the library's website. Typically, these slides promote events, and after a little evolving over the years, we've settled down into a standard format and style for these things. Last year, I was making this stuff in Photoshop, and it was based on a template. The workflow was pretty easy. Find an image that matches up with the event and drop it into the template. Size it up as needed, add a title where the title goes, there's even dummy text so all you had to do was click, then a branch and a time. There was also dummy text for that. It wasn't a lot of work, and after getting the flow down and lining up the images beforehand, I could roll out a new slide every minute or so. Not bad, especially since I was making around 40 to 60 slides per month. At a minute, that was only an hour or so out of the month. That's, that's fine. Then a few things changed. The big one was a push for more events and better promotion for those events. I'm not going to bore you with the details here, but the key words are, quote, more events and, quote, better promotion. In the space of 30 days, I went from making 40 to 60 slides per month to making well over 100, and that number kept going up for a little while. It soon became very clear that my Photoshop template and an hour per month wasn't going to cut it anymore. Sometimes I made the same amount of slides in one day that I used to make in a month. When it came to web slide creation, something had to change. Thing is, this isn't a standard automation task. Sure, the steps are mostly the same, but there was a lot of stuff that needed to be done that was sort of hands-on. You had to deal with an image, you had to deal with a title and a branch, and a time, and there's an informational bar on the slide that holds all the text, and that color can change. So you can change the color of that bar based on the design and the desire because one color doesn't always look good with a given picture. So there wasn't any talking to the ILS. There were no keyboard shortcuts, and the end result needed to be a PNG file. So what do? This time I turned to something I'd never used to solve a problem like this. The browser. These slides end up in a browser, and I thought it might be a worthwhile idea to start them there. But there was that problem, and it's the last part of the problem. I need a ping. The funny thing about using open source software as long as I have is that there are FOSS solutions I've used for years and don't know anything about them because they've always been built into the other things I'm using. After thinking about it for a few minutes, I knew I needed to do a couple things. I could use image magic to help create this slide. So that's great, but I needed to figure out how the heck to use image magic. Seriously, image magic is part of a lot of open source stuff. Blogging engines, image editors, content managers, and so on. Lots of things use image magic, and I've used a lot of things that use image magic. But I had no idea how to use only image magic. I know how to write a blog post, and I know how to drive, but I don't know how to take the engine out of one car and put it into another. So I spent about half a day off and on just looking at the image magic documentation and trying things. I installed it on a Linux box I had lying around the office and just kept feeding it commands and seeing what it spat out. Sometimes everything made sense and I got what I wanted and I felt a little bit of triumph there. And then I'd make a little adjustment because, you know, this thing could be tidied up a little bit. I could move this text over to here and that would look a lot better. And then I'd screw everything up again. But after a little practice, I could make it do the thing I wanted it to do, which was to create an image the same size as the web slides and put text in the right places. After that, I uh, turned to an old frenemy, PHP. PHP is a wonderful language where the mind runs free and logic need not always apply. You can do so many things in so many ways that it's almost possible for one PHP developer to look at another's code and not fully understand what they're trying to do. It's a mess. But I kind of sort of not really know what I'm doing with it, and better yet, you can use it to talk to image magic. See, that's one of the benefits of image magic. It works in a lot of places. 
So using PHP, I built a few pages to walk me through the process of creating a slide programmatically rather than manually in Photoshop. Since the slide has a few elements that are mostly the same from slide to slide, I created assets to help me build more slides. So for instance, a slide from the top down. We're going to look at this literally from the top down. There's an image that spans the full width of the slide. Below that is a colored box, and on the left where there is the event's title, date and time, and branch. That's where that text lives. Then there's the library's logo on the right that fills out the rest of the width on the bottom. I've included an example in the uh, show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. The image is always the same size, and it's located in the same place. But it's also the thing that's always different. After all, you pick an image to help promote the event. So the image that you might use for story time is not going to be the image that you use for an author visit. At least I hope not. If you're doing that, you're doing it wrong, and you should stop that. The colored box has four different colors to add some variety to the look of the front page. But the text in that box is always white, so that doesn't change. Finally, the logo is the logo. Since these things are always in the same place on the slide, we can build the same thing over and over, providing options for changes as needed. We use four different colors for that informational box, and since that box is always the same height and width, I pre-built those images and popped them into the working directory on the server. Because one of the other things that Image Magic can do, well, that's not fair, one of the many things that Image Magic can do is build other images or build new images from pre-existing images. So, okay, here's the workflow. First, there's the upload page. This is where everything starts with the image that you'll use for the slide. Given the dimensions of the finished slide, I set things up to prefer an image of 1,280 pixels wide. That's actually bigger than I need, but it usually allows me to get the snippet of the image that I want. In Photoshop, I'd have to resize this by hand. Now, you can go bigger, but smaller doesn't work so well. The image is, you know, it's just going to be pixelated. So the image is uploaded to a server where it's temporarily stored and then passed off to a brilliant module I happened across while researching solutions. It's called jcrop. JCrop allows you to feed it an image and then move a box around the image to crop out the part that you want. So with a little fiddling and adjustment to the JCrop defaults, I set that initial crop size to be the exact width and height of the image on the bar. So all I have to do is drag the box around the image and get the part of it that I want, and then click the crop button. That crop is also temporarily stored on the server, well, you're passed off to another page where everything sort of comes together. You're asked to enter that event title, the date and time, and select a branch. This is done as a drop-down, and that way you'll never have a typo in the branch name. Then select the color of the informational box. That's also a drop-down. It's got the four colors there that you can quickly select. Have a quick look to make sure everything is right, and then click the Generate Slide button. That's when PHP and Image Magic go to work. They take that cropped image, combine it with the information box color that you selected, and tack on the logo to the end. Then Image Magic uses its abilities to add text to an image, and that text is the event title in a large font with the time, date, and branch in a smaller font, and they're placed in their proper locations. Oh, Image Magic supports fonts really well, so you can program it to use the fonts that you like. In less than a second, I'm given a slide, uniquely named and ready to go. In keeping with the running theme of this show, the cost of this software was nothing, as it was all free and open source awesomeness. The server? Well, it's the same server that powers our library-wide digital signage stuff that I've mentioned before. It's a repurposed and resurrected Windows server that we were on the verge of surplusing. It really doesn't do much more than provide library-wide slides, and this little web app doesn't put any strain on it at all. After all, I'm not using it all the time. Oh, and making slides? Well, once I gather the images, which I just kind of do here and there throughout the day, I've got my list, I know what needs to be made, and I'll just take a few minutes here and there to 
pick out some images from a few public domain sites or from the stock photo sites that we subscribe to. It takes me around 20 seconds to make a slide after that. That means I'm rolling out 100 slides in just a little over half an hour. See? Now that is what computers are supposed to do. And that brings to a close another episode of Cyberpunk Librarian. I thank you for tuning in and thank you for waiting so long for a show to appear. Now that sort of things are calming down, I hope I can get these things out on a more regular basis as you're supposed to do. I do apologize for that and I'm going to try and be better about this in the future. I do have ideas and scripts sort of ready to go and hey, we are getting near episode 50 and that's going to be a special episode that I cannot wait to do. But first... I got to get there. So, you know, tune in, keep watching that podcatcher, and hopefully we can get things caught up properly. You want to check the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. The slide generator that I talked about, you'll find links to a GitHub repository there where you can download it for yourself, give it a shot, take a look and see what it does. If you've got the interest and you have to be running the Polaris ILS product, well, that might be a thing you could look into. After all, it's free and open source, and it's yours for the taking. The song you're currently digging on is Alleviation by Illusory Scapes. Earlier in the show, you heard from them with Cries of Your Love, Dance of My Imagination, and Wait for My Shadow. Great stuff that I found on the Free Music Archive. You'll find links to those songs in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. And as always, the opening track is Belly Dance at Abisu by Ryo Miyashita. Cyberpunk Librarian is hosted by the Internet Archive at archive.org. Great people doing great things, preserving and saving internet and cyber culture. I thank the Archive for not only hosting this show, but so much fantastic content and so many other podcasts. Check them out, Internet Archive at archive.org. If you like to listen to your podcast on a video site, well, who am I to judge? You can find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash cyberpunklibrarian or join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cyberpunklibrarian. If you'd like to reach out to me online, I love to hear from you. My uh, Twitter handle is at Bibrarian. That's B-I-B-R-A-R-I-A-N. It's like librarian, but it starts with a B. You can also find me on Google Plus. I am google.com slash plus Daniel Messer or just plain old cyberpunk librarian at gmail.com. Love to hear from you, and I hope I do, and I hope that you hear from me too on the next episode of Cyberpunk Librarian, which hopefully I can get out in a heck of a lot less time than the two months it took to pick this show back up. I thank you for tuning in. I thank you for sticking with the show. I will see you around next time, so take care, and remember, you don't have to be high-tech to be low-budget, but it certainly helps if you're a cyberpunk. Take care now.